Hey guys, it's your host Julian. This week I'm sitting down with the great one. My life is a teenage robot creator, Mr. Rob Renzetti. And we're going to chat all things about this amazing series from Nickelodeon. I want to give a special shout out to a couple of our patrons that help make this podcast possible. Bill, Brent, Patrick, and Jacob. Thank you all so much for your support. It truly means a lot. If you want to become a patron and help support this show, check the show notes below and sign up today. Now let's get to my chat with Rob Renzetti. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to What's My Head Podcast. I'm your host, Julian. Today, I'm joined by the great one, as I like to call him, Mr. Rob Renzetti. Rob, welcome back to the show, man. How are you? I'm good, Julian. How are you doing? <laughs> oh, fantastic. I've been looking forward to this one for quite some time, man. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, I figured uh, the first time you had, we had you on, we, we did Mean in the Count, which was my favorite thing of favorite things that you ever done. I absolutely love that six-part series. And I told you the next thank time you. you had on, uh, the next, thank you. Uh, the next time we had you on, we had to talk My Life as a Teenage Robot. So, I know you've told the pitch story before, but we had so many fans asking about the pitch story for My Life as a Teenage Robot. Would you mind telling that one to us again? Sure. I mean, there isn't much of a pitch story in that. I guess, well, I think in what you're talking about is how the pilot finally got yes. got made, which is um, I was doing Mina in the Count. I was doing uh, five more episodes of Mina in the Count. Uh, I had done one pilot with Mina in the Count at, at Hanna-Barbera. And then I'd moved to Nickelodeon basically because Fred Seibert, who ran the shorts program I was a part of and which Tina Robot actually came out of, um, wanted to do more Mina. So that's one reason I left Hannah Barbera, went to Nickelodeon. I did five Mina in the account shorts, but I was slated to do six, but Nickelodeon didn't want any more. Um, and we, I think we talked about the reasons for that. But um, so I had this extra slot and I figured uh, Fred was just going to give it away. At that point, both Larry Huber and um, and Butch Hartman had been doing um, Chalk Zone and Fairly Apparent shorts. And it looked like one of those was going to become a series. I think Chalk Zone was actually first and then Fairly Apparent just one second. So I figured you would just give that slot to one of those guys. Instead, he said, like, no, I want you to have that slot, Rob. Do something else. Do some other thing that you want to do. Um, so I pitched him three ideas. One of them was about, uh, one of the ideas I had was about a, um, a teenage girl, a human teenage girl who had a robot for a boyfriend. And the robot was just a robot. He had no emotions. He had nothing. He was just, he was, he was a robot. He was a pleasant robot. He like wanted to help people and, and was pleasant. But the teenage girl just like, it, like had this soap opera like relationship mostly in her head between her and this robot. It didn't exist, but she like invented drama that wasn't there. And um, I pitched that to Fred along with two other ideas that I don't remember anymore now. Uh, and Fred's reaction was like, well, Nickelodeon doesn't want more episode more of me in the count because it's too weird for them to have a little girl who's best friends with a vampire i don't think the best idea is to have a teenage girl who's now dating a robot like so yeah. you know because like there was no sexual not supposed to be any sexual tension between mina and the count like that was it was completely innocent but nickelodeon was just like well drag you know vampires are sexy so it's got to be there i'm like it's not there but then like when i was pitching a robot with a boy you know robot uh, boyfriend for a teenage girl like, like yes there's sexual tension right there in the idea so i said okay i understand i'll go away i'll think about it and then i was uh driving to i was driving to the grocery store and just thinking about like well, what am i going to do and just thinking about things in general and then the idea for to make the teenage uh, girl the robot to make them one character to squeeze them together and make them one robot occurred to me and basically the whole story for the pilot just kind of fell out of my head like literally just like in a matter of a few minutes as i was driving i had the whole thing so i pulled over i wrote down all the bullet points on the back of my grocery list and um and that was the pilot i pitched to fred he said yes i made the pilot and uh, and then three years later the series came along that's really cool man it so you've you've done the thank you for sending that story by the way. Uh, sure. You've done pitching at both Cartoon Network Studios and Nickelodeon. Yes. Was there a, a significant difference from the pitching process for both? Were they kind of the same? I have to imagine two different studios have two different processes. You would imagine that, but in this case, no, they weren't because I was pitching to Fred Cyber both times. Mm -hmm. um, Fred was the president at Hanna Barbera, and he started the shorts program there. And I pitched Mina, the first Mina pilot, under that program to him in a room for, full of other people. And then the only difference at Nickelodeon was I was mostly just pitching to him. There was one other guy in the room with him, um, Eric Homan, 
um, not to be confused with Eric Coleman, who was an who was an executive at Disney, but Eric Coleman, who was a right hand man of Fred's for many many years, um, the two of them were basically the people that I pitched to, and it was really just about pleasing Fred. So, um, you know, once I got the pilot, it was up to Fred what what he made. So uh, Nickelodeon really didn't have a say in it. The only thing they had a say in was canceling the Mina shorts. They basically said no more, Fred. We don't want any more. But she, but they couldn't have stopped him from you know uh, me making making them to begin with. So. Um, you know, when I pitched Dean and Drew out to him, he was like, yep, that's it. Love it. Go do it. And uh, so I did it. And it was the last thing I did in this uh, like three year stretch of doing pilots. And, um, you know, I was lucky that Alex Kerman was also part of the, the um, pilot program, working on his own stuff, working on other people's shows. And he, he and I did it together. I did the rough thumbnail board for it and then he made it look nice. So the two of us were together on the project from the very beginning. Now, when I reached out to you and I told you I want to talk uh, My Life's a Teenage Robot, there was three episodes um, in particular that you, you said you wanted to talk to. Yep. Um, and those three were Speak No Evil, Victim of Fashion, and Indestruct... Uh, oh, man, Indestructible. Uh, that was a tongue <laughs> twister. I can't, I, can, I can't say it either, so don't worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it makes me feel just a touch better, man. Um, so with these three episodes, which one do you want to start with first? I figured we'd go sequential because I kind of picked them because each one is from the three seasons. So Speak No Evil was a season one idea, Victim was in season two, and and uh, Indestructible was in season three. And I know you mentioned these were my favorite episodes. They're among my favorites. I, mm. I can't, I don't think I could narrow it down to three, um, but they are among my favorites for various reasons, which we can discuss. But um, yeah, we'll you know, start with Speak No Evil. Beautiful. Let's go for it, man. So how does this one actually, actually before we do that, whenever you guys are writing a, a, an entire season out, uh, do you guys are just who who's who's your head writer at this time? Who are you pitching ideas to your writer's room or your board artists? Uh, I wish I had a writer's room. I had a writer um, <laughs> uh, in season one. Mike Bell was my um, was my uh, story editor and he's an art. He's an artist. He's also a writer. He uh, was in the shorts program as well. He uh, did a couple of uh, uh, series ideas during the um, Oh Yeah cartoon short the movie the most well known one was um, Super Santa uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if you ever saw that one but it was like basically Santa as a superhero um, I forget how many right. he did those maybe he did four maybe five or six I don't remember but um, he was also the voice of Santa but he's a very very funny guy a uh, guy I know for a long time um, and so uh, you know I wanted someone funny to be my story editor so he was it and um, yeah so we kind of all would pitch ideas to each other, but we didn't really have a writer's room. It was just me, uh, him, um, Alex sometimes was in on the mix, the store, but ours would some kind, sometimes, sometimes come in when we were brainstorming ideas. Um, uh, season one, I had a kind of a bunch of ideas stored up though. So we kind of were running on that. And then when we kind of ran out of those, then he would pitch me ideas. Mike's the one who came up with Jenny's, um, Jenny's uh, sisters. Um, gotcha. He's the one that thought like she's her her model number is XJ9. Where, where is XJ1 through XJ8? That was Mike's yeah. idea, um, and he actually did a did a rough did the first rough sketch of them as well. Um, so I was very lucky to have Mike. He uh, he was only there for season one though. But um, uh, but at this time when we were doing season one, um, we were just pitching different ideas. One of the ideas I had was the the first in this evil series, which was Ear No Evil. Um, the one where Jenny sees like Brit and Tiff and all her their girl crew have pierced ears and she wants to get in on the action of having pierced ears except she doesn't have ears yeah. so she asks Sheldon to make her ears and he makes them way too large and she becomes a laughing stock um, we did a lot of like body horror stuff with Jenny like for comedy yeah. right but like that one of the basic ideas of being a teenager is like you're not comfortable in your body and like Absolutely. Jenny is not comfortable with what she is as a robot she gets you know she gets uh so that was a big theme in season one and ear no evil was just one of the episodes we did and i don't know who came up with that title for the episode it's a silly pun you know based on the hear no evil speak no evil see no evil um but since we did hear no evil it basically prompted me to do two more episodes speak no evil and see no evil and then basically it's funny because usually that's not where ideas come from i don't usually get titles and make cartoons based on titles craig mccracken my friend does that a lot he's a big yeah great uh, manipulator of language and a lot of times he'll, the title will be the first thing for him or the name of the character will be the first thing he comes up with and he works from there. It's more unusual for me but in this instance I knew there needed to be an episode called Speak No Evil so the idea kind of came out of the title. Um, yes. 
<laughs> you let me go. I'll just keep talking. So, you know, if you want to put questions in or say oh. things yourself, just let me know. <laughs> oh, no, absolutely. I, I love I love when you guys just go because it makes my job that much easier. Um, <laughs> I, the, the titles have never, never come up before. And before we dive into the episode, you know, at what point for you, because you said it was a little bit more difficult than it would be for Craig or somebody else to come up with a title or a character name or something like that. At what point are you starting to look for titles for uh, episode names? Right before the title card needs to be made. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, literally, the, the title is temporary until we make decide we've got to make the title card. And then I got to decide, is this the real title or do we have to change it up? So there's a lot of like fan consternation. I don't know if we call it consternation, but confusion out there. Like they find old lists of episodes and they're wondering what this episode is. And it's just like it's just an old title for an episode that exists like there aren't there aren't secret episodes that were never made. I mean, there are a few that got like the idea got shot down by the execs, but um, but, you know, like the, if an episode got made, it's just sometimes the title was just temporary because you got to you sometimes once you get the episode done and you see the episode, and you see what the story is, you'll say that'll give you a better title or you'll just, you know, like it'll be like, oh, it's not really about that anymore. What do we call it? Um, so, you know, in the meantime, the title is just temporary. We just use it. It gets a little confusing because then you'll see model sheets that don't have a real title on it and all that kind of stuff. But the mod, the, the episode number is what production uses. So it doesn't really matter that the title changes even at the very last minute. Um, gotcha. But so, yeah, that's basically we're just kind of using a working title until we, we have to have a final title. Um, but uh, but Speak No Evil had the title from the very beginning because of Ear No Evil. You know, I knew what it was called right off the bat. But most times we, you know, I'd say like maybe I don't know, I, have to, I can't do a count now, but like maybe 30% to 50% of the episodes to change their title, you know, from what we originally came up with. Right on. Um, I mean, I, I really wish, uh, I know some shows are starting to do it. Um, you know, I've seen it with uh, Cuphead more recently. You mm -hmm. know, the title cards are coming back because that was some of the coolest things about Cartoon Network back in the day was all these different shows. They all had different title cards. And it just felt like it was an event. It felt like a premiere seeing that mm -hmm. title card come up and an episode name. Um, it was just really, really cool. So I, I liked seeing that, uh, like, even though it wasn't a return to form, but going back in time and watching these now as an older guy, just it felt uh, felt like a kid again, tuning into a cartoon that I tuned into when I was a kid. Yeah, um, so I mean, why Fred, did... Fred kind of insisted on that. And uh, Joe Holt, my background designer, designed almost all the title cards, and he just kind of did them digitally and did a great job. Um, and he could really whip them out so i did have a i was able to like delay on final titles for a long good long time but eventually he's like he'd come to me like i need the title for this episode i gotta do the title card i'd be like oh crap okay we'll come up with a little one does does one title card maybe one or two stick out the most to you no i love i mean they're just all so incredible but um I, i'd have to look at them again <laughs> yeah <laughs> but like i honestly don't remember a lot of what looked them look like fred's got them all up online still like in one of his various websites because he's got a million websites but you can find he them all me, online he sent me a book i don't know if he's got them all in there but on um, all the shows that he's his name is attached to it's got title mm -hmm. cards it's a really cool book yeah. um yeah so i like i said i love title cards man um so when when i had asked you those three episodes obviously you said you had to do three of them here speak and see for the no evil sequence mm -hmm. um why did speak no evil stick out to you the most I mean, mostly because I had the heaviest hand in that one. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Chris Mitchell, who was the original storyboard artist, um, you know, did a great job. And one of the reasons he was a storyboard artist is he's like uh, has Japanese descent, and uh, so he could do the Japanese parts. Um, yeah. And uh, you know, but but at some point, I always like took a pass on the boards myself. And in this instance, like the kind of the middle part where Jenny is like kind of failing it. Um, failing at saving Tremerton from the fire, um, I kind of took that over and kind of went in and changed a lot of stuff. Um, and I'm always, you know, I'm always wanting someone else to come up with the gags and do the story and I'm mm -hmm. happy to have someone else do it. And I really kind of resist, resist going in and changing things, but like it's some, like there's a there's always a gut check point. And this happened with all my board artists. It's not like Chris is the only one that's like, nope, you didn't get it 100% right. Everybody like, at one some point I'm just like, mm, that's not quite right. Um, so I would go in and change things. This episode, I'd like changed a lot of that stuff and came up with really dumb gags. Like my, the one that I always reference is the one where Jenny's asking for someone, she throws this hose that comes out of yeah. her belly <laughs> for the fire hydrant. And she's asking various passersby to like, you know, the hose, I need you to connect the hose to the fire hydrant, but she can only speak Japanese. So nobody understand her, stands her. And there's some really dumb jokes there where this passerby comes by after the first one gets knocked out 
and he's like oh this and she thinks he thinks she, he she wants to talk to the guy and then she mentions the hose and then he uses the hose to knock on the guy's head and then she points a fire hydrant and he's like he's like um oh you want the you're looking at this and then he picks up a dog from behind a fire hydrant. yeah i came up with all those dumb gags uh and you know i was always like he was always like are these too dumb uh, and I was had the very rare experience. This episode was actually submitted to the Ottawa Film Festival in 2004. And actually, Nickelodeon set me up there. They set, they paid for me to go up to the film festival. Um, and it was like nominated in this category. I ended up winning the category. I don't remember exact category. Um, it was nominated, but it ended up winning the category. Um, but there was a screening and they had a screening of Speak No Evil in, mm -hmm. in this festival. And I was in the audience. And that's it's always nerve wracking watching something you've created with an audience because you're you know i have a lot of uh self-doubt as an artist it's like is that really good but like people watch the episode and they like laughed at my dumb jokes and i was like so pleased that this like went over and that the jokes were that people found these jokes funny um so that's one of the really because i had an experience with this this episode that i didn't have with any other experience any other episode we, we would we sometimes screened episodes in 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 the nickelodeon gym um for like the love people outside the crew but this was like an audience of non-animators. Like this was just a normal general audience, even though, I mean, it was an animation festival, so people like animation, but they're not necessarily all in the industry. So it was very exciting and very nerve wracking to be put in that situation. And the cartoon generally went over well. So that was very pleasing to me. And that's one reason that like this one is very close to my heart. Because I worked, I did a lot of the gags myself and because I saw an audience and saw that those gags actually worked. Hey there, I'm Isaiah and welcome to my channel, 47 Cartoon Guy, a channel dedicated to all things animation and nostalgia. I do retrospectives, short comedic videos, and remember videos, if I can get away with it that is. I have many videos dedicated to some of my favorite animation properties, such as nostalgic lookbacks on Cartoon Network's Golden Age, and also videos focusing on Scooby-Doo, one of my favorite cartoons of all time. In my most recent series, The Fantastic Legacy of Hanna-Barbera, dives into the history of the legendary animation studio and its founders. If you love my videos, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and click the bell icon so you'll know when I have a new video up. And also consider donating to my Patreon, where you can support the channel and get early access to videos, behind the scenes pics, and even view exclusive future remember videos. Thanks for watching and I hope to see you soon. Until next time, I'm 47 Cartoon Guy, and I gotta fly. I will say my favorite part in this entire episode was your gags and him picking up the dog because you're like, oh, okay, this is where he's going to hook it up a hose and he just hands a dog. And I'm like, ah, I like that part because it was just that it was that rule of three. It was the third thing that he mm -hmm. did, you know, in, in that yes. line. So I, I really liked all of those gags. Um, Thank you. Now, when you're watching <laughs> this episode with a a live crowd, an audience, a civilian, some civilians, some people in the industry, mm -hmm. when do you start feeling comfortable? Do you, do you? I know that's 20 years ago now at this point, but do you remember? Like, I got to imagine just sitting there watching that. There's some point. Maybe what was the first laugh that you got? Do you remember? I don't remember the first laugh, but I mean, that's when you start feeling comfortable is when people start yeah. laughing at the jokes. If you know when they when they actually laugh at it. Um, uh, you know. Um, the first, the first experience I really had of this was the first Mina and the Count pilot, which was mm -hmm. um, that I did at Hanna Barbera. They, Fred did a screening of that, like of a of the batches of shorts. I think I was in maybe the second screening because he would do like mine came later. Like my Mina came later. Like Dexter and Powerpuff had already been done, mm -hmm. and they those guys were already working on the second of each of those, and I was doing my first. Um, but we did the screening at the this uh, place called the Academy, like it's an official Academy, um, like film Academy location. And we were in a, again, it was an audience for a wider audience than just animation, but it's mostly animation insiders, people that necessarily didn't work at Hanna-Barbera, but were in the industry. And that went over well too. And it, it didn't get a ton of laughs, but it like got a huge applause at the end of it. Like people really liked it, like as a story. And um, actually out of that screening, my, I got my agent, um, who I still am with to this day, like he, uh john goldsmith who at that time it was part of an agency called metropolis like called me up after seeing my short and said if you ever need an agent i'd love to represent you um so like that screening was also very important to me but um but so yeah you know it's it's always yeah when you first get you get your first laugh that's when you start to relax like well at least that one worked <laughs> if no other <laughs> jokes in this one worked at least that one worked yeah, at least you got one right i, yeah. I like that 
Um, was there any pushback from Nickelodeon that you remember uh, of it being just all Japanese until she got her, she got that that uh, English back? There was a there was an effort to there was a thought to like maybe we should need subtitles and I was dead set against it. That was the only pushback really was just like they were worried. Um, but like the episode is very deliberately set up to get you through that part because mm -hmm. she basically and I, I like doing this a lot. I like parallels and cartoons, but like her saving the Japanese town parallels her trying to save Tremerton almost to the shot like there are literally shots that are copied the same way it all the both of them start with this guy jumping up and screaming and close to screen and screaming there's a similar shots like both of them there's a giant globe involved in both episodes she's she's asking the crowd to do the same thing at the start like you know quiet down calm down and you know all the, all the things that in when she's doing it in, in the japan sec section at the beginning she says english and then she says it in japanese yes. like and so you're like, I like, I'm like, I'm doing all this for the audience. The audience can sit through the Japanese. They'll get it. They'll understand it. Um, and generally from what I've seen, people do, um, you know, but that was, there was a real strong push from the execs. They wanted to have subtitles. And I'm like, no, absolutely not. That defeats the whole purpose of this episode, which is that she is not communicating with English people. And you're, you want the audience to have the same experience that the other characters are having in the episode, trying to relate to Jenny, but not being able to understand what she's saying. Yeah, I, I liked it, and it, until you until you mentioned it, I, I did notice because, like you said, that she would start talking in Japanese and then finish in English, or start in English and then finish in Japanese before she lost that that voice modulator, yeah. um, you know, that 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 uh, ability to speak in English. Um, I have to imagine this one, um, you know, the internet starting hit around two thousand four ish. Um, did you get any like positive fan mail or any cool fan mail that might have been from folks over in Japan? No, no, I didn't get it. I wish that would really? be great. Um, no, I didn't get anything from anybody in Japan. Um, I mean, eventually I knew that there were fans in Japan and, and, mm -hmm. and that started trickling in. But at that point, no, <laughs> no, not yeah. right. Not right away. Um, and it's funny because I just uh, while I was reviewing today, I came upon the, ver the Japanese version where Jenny is speaking. You know, she's speaking Japanese and when she, she loses the ability to speak Japanese and don't currently speak in English. And uh, you know the Japanese uh, actress is not fluent in English <laughs> and not speaking English very well, uh, as opposed to Janice, uh, the vo the real voice of Jenny, the true voice of Jenny, who is fluent in Japanese. And it's one of the reasons we did this episode because I knew she was fluent in Japanese, um, and I knew she could pull it off, and, and it would sound natural. Um, and in fact, even though Chris Mitchell uh, came up with a lot of the Japanese dialogue, he is not. He wasn't fluent in Japanese, and so. Uh, during the during the record janice like adjusted a lot of lines and said this is kind of off he actually would be more like this i'm like you change things however you think they need to be changed so that they are authentic um so um you know to the best of her ability and the best of her knowledge she made some little adjustments to the japanese dialogue as we as we recorded it uh, but that was another reason why we, we made this episode what the story of this episode is what it is is because i knew she was going to japanese Dude, that's insane because I like I, I was getting then my next question was be like who'd you get to to play Japanese Jenny or the Japanese voice for Jenny and then it's the same per that's so wild talk about mm -hmm. a, a thing you could have in your pocket or it won't win you any any cool points going on like hey man Jenny from my life as a teenage robot she can also speak Japanese and she can speak English really well it's I mean like it's not gonna be on jeopardy or anything but that'd be cool <laughs> you know? cool little party snack yeah you know? we're lucky it was uh, lucky to have her as the voice she I'm but she was very unique and she brought some a lot of character to Jenny and she was able to do the Japanese episode without bringing somebody else in. So that was real helpful. Oh, man, that's so cool. Um, we actually had a fan's question um, about uh, about the voice of Jenny. Was there anybody else in consideration before her? Sure. I mean, uh, when I did the pilot, I usually when you do pilots like that, you get auditions and you you. Um, you tell the voice director what you're after and they will come and they'll bring in anywhere from 10 to 15 people in, mm -hmm. a, in a day. And you'll, you'll have like an audition session where you like, they do, you, you do like a one page of like maybe three, four, five pieces of dialogue, try and get the range of the character, like get one where they're angry or one where they're laughing or one where they're being sly or whatever the aspects of the character that you're really most concerned about. You kind of try and get those into a few pieces of dialogue and then you audition and you'll audition like i said you could audition 15 people maybe you know maybe as little as 10 maybe a little less but usually you want to get 
So you get a range of people and then you kind of listen. You have your first impressions and you kind of make notes on your script. I, at least I do make scripts, script notes and like, you know, give them like different categories, like acting, the, vo the voice quality, all mm -hmm. that kind of stuff, like how well, they all they do. And then you kind of put that aside and you don't get your, you don't get, you, you get a tape eventually and you listen to it again and you have to make a final decision. But um, you'd like, sometimes your impressions totally change. And sometimes like what you're hearing live is very different when it's recorded. So um, usually you're given a little bit of time after the auditions um, and to make your choices. Um, so I did that with all the characters, like the, for the pilot, it was, um, you know, the four mains, Tuck, Brad, Jenny, and, and, and Dr. Wakeman. Um, and the, all the all them from the pilot survived except for Chad, uh, um, Chad Doric, who became the voice of Brad. Um, there was a, another middle-aged woman doing his voice in the pilot, and I I knew because I was going to have to you you have to use your main voices as secondary voices um, a lot of the time because for budgetary reasons because you can get each voice actor to play three characters for the same price as one. So you want to have people in your main cast that are flexible. Um, and I wanted to have like, I need a, I need an actual man in this main cast so that like, if I have other man voices, I can have someone to do them. So uh, Chad was the only one that got changed from the pilot, but the other three, Audrey, Candy Milo, uh, Audrey Wazuska, she said Candy Milo, Janice Kwai, they're all from the pilot and they all were with the actual series. What was it uh, about about her that, that sold it for you as Jenny? Was there one quality, obviously, so you listen to it live, and you listen to the recording, but was there anything, obviously something set, uh, set her apart from everybody else, but what was that thing that set her apart? I mean, she was doing, she did like a, she did a super cute voice, um, mm -hmm. which, you know, as a superhero, you know, you might like lean into like a tough girl voice, but yeah. like Jenny is a reluctant superhero. She doesn't want to be a superhero. She wants to be a typical teenage girl. So I've wanted her voice to kind of lean in that direction because her appearance was going to be that of a robot. You know, it's obviously a very stylish yeah. robot <laughs> with, with like candy colors and stuff. She's not gray or anything like that, though. There was discussion about that at first, um, you know, but, uh, you know, so I wanted that part of her to sound cute. So the fact that Janice had a really cute voice, just naturally cute. She, this is her this is a natural voice. She's really not doing any kind of um, tweaking to her natural speaking voice. And she was a good actress. So. Um, you know, the, the one thing I'll, 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 I'll call her in now. The one thing that was always tough with her was to get her to laugh. I really, yeah. she got better and better at it throughout the series, but at first, like she couldn't, sometimes people just can't laugh because it's, unless they're really, really laughing. So it would, took a lot of work to get her to laugh in a way that I would be satisfied with. But beyond that, she, I, she was great. She always nailed her lines and, and got what I wanted. Um, and eventually she became very good at laughing through my torture of like making her do take after take after take. Yeah, like I said, I, I there's not one thing that I would change about this show. I mean, I'm pretty sure you being the creator, you might see some things you do differently now. But, you oh, know, sure. from the 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 boarding to the writing to the animating, I mean, I, I just love like every every bit of it and getting to go back because I haven't gotten to watch this show in quite some time. So I'm glad you gave me three episodes because I went back and watched these. And then after I watched these three episodes, I went and bought all three of the, the wow. volumes or the seasons they have on iTunes. So awesome. Yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to diving back into it. Um, <clears throat> uh, with that being said, before we rotate off of um, of see no evil or uh, excuse me, um, speak no evil. Um, obviously, you said the the couple parts that you got to do that you really had a, had fun with those gags um, towards the end of the episode. Mm -hmm. What was something that you loved about the episode that you didn't work on? So one of the other guys, I think you said it was Mitchell, Chris Mitchell. Yeah, I mean, Chris came up with all the dumb uh, tuck jokes about him not being understanding the water monster mm -hmm. and doing yeah. the exact opposite of what he should do. Uh, and uh, I mean, I love the general look of the episode. Um, I think it was um, Alex Kerwin who came up with the idea of um, using Chinese hopping vampire ghosts mm -hmm. as the villain in Japan. And I really love that. He actually given me, he gave me like at one point, I just don't, still don't have it or I'd pull it up, but I had like a, he gave me like a, a wind up hopping ghost like plastic figure that was about this big and you mm -hmm. wind it up and actually hopped on your desk oh, that's uh, really and I, cool. I can't remember whether he got, i think he gave that to me before we came up with this episode um yeah. uh so that like he the designs of the the ghosts as usually he usually did most of the monster designs he did that so um i really loved the way that looked i love the way the bgs in um in japan turned out um mm -hmm. the look of those um and that was uh, sana hong was my lead um 
Fiji painter for most of the series, and she um, she came up with the look for that. So um, yeah, I was really pleased with how the Japanese uh, section looked, and uh, the, the character designs there, and and the, and the background, the background feeling, and and, and the vampire uh, vampire bad guys. Um, I loved all I loved all the aspect of that. So actually had uh, don't have it out anymore, but I had uh, at one point I had uh, one of the BG, uh, the painted BGs um, decorating my office, but I, I put it away now. I rotate things in and out, and that's that's a way right at the moment. That's cool. But man. Yeah, I loved, uh, loved if, how the loved how it looked. Uh, I mean, I, I did too, man. Uh, backgrounds are, are some of my favorite things. They are my favorite things in animation, and you guys always had phenomenal backgrounds. So hats off to thank her. You. Um, for thank you for just creating a, a world that everybody wanted to inhabit. Um, so speak no evil finished with that one uh which one did you want to go to i wish i would have wrote season two and three and one next to these ones but well, the next one is vic the next one in season two is victim of fashion the big okay. uh, the big the big episode okay victim um, of fashion why did you pick yes. this one uh well for a couple reasons um one was well l let me see what's the best way to approach this i love i love them um, basically i loved um jenny's new attitude in this this was actually mm -hmm. the first uh, episode of season two to at least in terms of the official order of things um and um you know Britt and tiff had been beaten up on jenny for a season and she made some efforts to be friends with them um i wanted to play her kind of naive towards their nastiness a lot of the time and like that she doesn't get it she doesn't get that they're being mean to her it's especially true in the first episode uh, which is the first school up where she goes to school uh, i think it was called class action if i remember the title that was like the second or third episode of the C series um where she meets Britt and Tiff. Um, but you know, they're just nasty little, little, uh, biatches. And, uh, you know, so <laughs> and I love them by the way, they're my favorite. They're my, them yeah. and Vexus obviously, but they're my favorite. They're the, my favorite villains. Um, and, um, uh, they kind of break cartoon convention in that, like they have several different costumes. Like they always, because they were so fashion forward, mm -hmm. <laughs> so to speak, which is not something we really had until we started kind of doing the seas the, up the, the series, which was like the idea that like, what are we, what kind of hook are we going to give them? And um, at this point, there was um, this uh, again. Alex had this outrageous collection of um, I'm, I'm blanking on what the name of the Japanese culture is called, but the like these Japanese young women who wore these really outrageous um, geishas. A, no, not geishas, but like modern pop outfits. What was the, they had a name for him and I can't think of it right now. Anyways, he had this compilation book where all these crazy, crazy costumes. And he said, we should have Britain Tiff look like this. They should be like, not only should they be into fashion, but they should be into these really crazy outfits. So I'm like, that sounds great. So we basically had this resource book for, to pull from. But um, so we did that throughout season one where you'd see them and they'd be in a new weird outfit or they'd, you know, they never look quite the same. Um, you know, unlike this typical cartoon characters, which way they always are in the same outfit and everybody else in the show is in the same outfit. They're all typical cartoon characters, including Jenny. So like the, the concept of this episode was like, they don't like the fact that for one minute, Jenny has the attention of the other school kids. And so they call her out for watching the same, uh, wearing the same thing every day, basically her body, her body is her outfit and she's always in the same outfit. Um, so the idea that like, rather than, um, like just beat the crap out of them which was what she could do as a superhero <laughs> but would but would have been frowned on by the um by the uh the powers that be uh we kind of went in the other direction and did like this crazy double linked episode that's all about fashion <laughs> mm -hmm. you know which i'm just pleased that on a superhero show on a show where in a, in a network where like we can't lose the boy viewers. They like allowed me to do a half hour that was all about a series three women who are competing uh, to be more fashionable yeah. than than the other one. Um, and the, I love this episode. I loved it so much. And one of the reasons it's double um, double length normal episode is is because I didn't want to lose anything that um, uh, Brandon Cruz and Alex uh, Kerwin himself actually ended up doing the storyboard. But Brandon was the original storyboarder on this, and he came up with all this th great stuff like. I think we've talked about this before, but on Teenage Robot, like the board artists got, get an outline. They get like a two or three page outline, not a script. So they come up with most of the gags. They come up with, the, you know, they are given a story to follow and kind of like, this is the angle that should, this is the comedic take on it, blah, 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 go forward. But they come up with the, most of the dialogue. They come up with most of the gags. Um, and Brandon just came up with all this amazing stuff. And I knew like, 
it was not 11 minutes long. I knew it was longer than 11 minutes. I'm like, this is probably like 15 minutes long. And, you know, there's this this phrase that's a hoary old cliche, both in live, I think it's in live action as well as animation, but it's called kill your darlings, right? You have to give up. Yeah. You have to kill stuff that you're in favor of. Mostly it's meant to mean like, it may not serve the purposes of the story. You need to, even though you love this sequence or you love this character, or you love this idea, you've got to kill it because it doesn't work with the story you're trying to tell. Well, in this episode, I decided to save my darlings. I wasn't going to kill any of the great stuff that I loved that Brandon did. I decided this is longer than 11. I'm going to make it 22. It's going to be a 22 minute episode. Um, and I don't remember, I think I got, a, I don't remember getting approval. I know I did, but I basically like was just like, we got to do this. And um, the execs to their credit allowed me to do it. Um, so a lot of the best, a lot of the best stuff that there is in the episode, like was is allowed to be there because we were allowed to expand it. So the story is not that complicated. Then what you could do it in 11 minutes, but you know, there's all this like fashion showdown, the fashion war stuff where they're like, first they're cowboys. And then um, what's the second thing? I'm getting the second thing now. Oh, they're in the garden and mm -hmm. you know, Jenny becomes they're a butterfly. Bugs. And then there's this huge Busby Berkeley swimming pool musical sequence where there's all this transformation stuff. None of that would have been in an 11 minute version of the episode. Like none of like the big uh, sequence where, um, you know, she's trying to learn to transform into fashion before that. And, and the other big sequence where Sheldon takes is taking all of her weapons out of her. Mm -hmm. Like there, there's those who were there in the original board, but like, I wouldn't have been able to fit them. I wouldn't even know how to tell, I wouldn't have known how to, the story would have been so less satisfying, at least for me, if I had, had to strip it down to 11 minutes. So we expanded it. We got to do all these crazy, like nonverbal sequences that were just like visual um, tour de forces. And, um, you know, Brandon did some of those. Alex did a lot of the others. Alex did like the whole fashion war thing and came up with all those tr crazy transformations. He was the king of Jenny's transformations. Like he did all that. I never did any of the transformation stuff. Brandon was, Brandon was really good at doing the transformation stuff too. And he came up with a lot of the, like the fighting sequence transformations and stuff. So they were both really good at that stuff. So it's very crazy transformation heavy. All that's geared towards like fashion. You get to see Brit in some amazing crazy outfits. I love that first like the 80s outfit that they first show up yeah. in. And then this, the disco outfit that they show up the next day. That was so Jenny, dope. Jenny responds by transforming into like a, a, a pimp. 70s pimp. <laughs> um, like all that, like it was just like, it was just like, you know, design was really a strength of the show. Like, and so I was just like, let's just lean into it and do as much as we possibly can. And we'll, you know, and so in, I've had a career of killing my darlings, but in this instance, this is one where I decided to save the patient and like basically augment the patient, make it into a, a greater, a greater force than it otherwise could have been by making it twice as long. So that's one of the reasons it's one of my favorites. It's none didn't do that. I mean, we had other, we ended up doing other longer format stuff, but like this was kind of an accidental longer format thing. And I'm very happy that I didn't like do the practical things that did like that. Did the like, you know, I want to do something that's going to feel good to me, even though it doesn't, it's not practical and it'll, it would, it would cause problems with production and all that. And like, but I'm like, I don't care. I want to do it. And now that cartoon exists because we decided to make the impractical choice in this one instance. Uh, and uh, I'm very pleased that we did. I am too, man, because sometimes you just got to pick a hill to die on, and I'm glad you picked it on this one. Um, what I loved about this one, and you said the two the two, two scenes in particular, they're getting off the bus, everything goes disco. I loved the alternating colors on the bus lights, and it would flip-flop mm -hmm. in the background. It was just, it really, it sucked you in right away. I, I just thought it was a really cool for the longest time I don't remember I told you before we hit record I don't remember seeing this one so this I think mm -hmm. this might have been a first or if I did see this one it was a one time thing and it was almost 20 years ago now at this point um, yeah. but it, it sucked me in with that scene right away and then you see Pimp Daddy Jenny or Pimp Mommy Jenny I, whatever you want to call it <laughs> I was like is she turning into a pimp and it was just so cool I loved that whole sequence and then uh, you know yeah, I loved like I said I loved all the transformations this was like as the kids like to say top tier right the transformations <laughs> in this episode were yeah. so cool and so inventive and just so out there um what what would you say that that the board artist name or the designer was oh brandon brandon cruz was the original board oh. artist he's one of my one of my top guys was with me actually met him while we were both working on uh, family guy he was a board artist on family guy 
and I was a director for just a couple episodes and I actually got to work with him um, on I think one of the two maybe both of the episodes I worked on and I was just like so impressed with him when I got picked up um, I kept his contact and kept in contact with him and when I got my show he was one of the first people I approached and uh, he was there from beginning to end he was there all three seasons uh, and I was so lucky to have him really creative really funny guy um, really became he was started off as a really good story bars and became like a superstar by the end in terms of at least how I felt like he just got better and better with every episode he did really funny and really great draftsman great and great visual and um, like visual ideas great story ideas great gag ideas it's really really one of my favorites and uh, this was a moment for him he really he really shined um, I have to say I have to give also give credit to one of my favorite gags in this episode which is the um, when at the end of the pimp uh transformation jenny gets uh gets high gets platform shoes that are filled with water and little robo fish. fish robo goldfish drop Dude. into it that was all kerwin kerwin came up with all that and, that was uh, so I, dope i loved that <laughs> i loved it so it, it was, was really, so cool seeing the water fill up I'm, I'm like where are they going i was like is that is that a gas or is that a fume what is that and then you see the fish just pop out i'm like oh shit, that was so cool man high fives <laughs> From me to Brandon and Alex, man, the, the, like I said, the, that scene was just so cool. Um, when uh, when you have to run this up the flagpole in order for it to to be approved, does that have to go all the way up, or is it just whoever your executive is at that time? Well, yeah, they have a, a Nickelodeon. They had what they called an executive in charge or an EIC, mm -hmm. and um, I had two of them. Uh, Rich Magaanes would have been the one. Um, um, I think I think uh, it was Rich at this time. Um, but like basically they're they're your they're your connection to the execs. Um, but behind them is like an unknown number of people that also weigh yeah. in because then they filter all the they all talk about the episode somewhere in an undisclosed location. And dark um, alleyway. Yeah, well, I don't know. Yeah, or evil lair or whatever, <laughs> however you feel about execs. But um uh and then basically they like bring their notes together and agree like these are the notes we're going to present to rob and then rich would be the one that would present me with the notes um and actually he was the only like he would be the one that would attend the um the uh the 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 pitch like the mm -hmm. when the board artist would pitch to the crew in room uh rich and then eventually audrey deal was his like assistant and then audrey took over as the ic for i think maybe around this time second or second and second and third season i think rich was just on the first season as dic um, and they were both great. I loved them both. I had a great time working with them. They were always, they understood the show. They got the gags. They were big proponents of the show. They were big champions of the show. And they were, you know, we were usually on the same side, um, you know, and if I could, you know, uh, I was reasonable on some things and gave on some things and I would fight for certain things. So they knew that I wasn't just fighting for the sake of fighting now on everything. But like when I felt strongly about something, you know, they usually would see the, you know, give me my, Give me the rope to hang myself with and if it you know gotcha. turned out bad it was on me and if it turned out good then you know they were the exact said good. yes so yeah yeah um how hard is it to change gears from 11 minutes to 22 minutes is it easier to flush out an entire story in 22 than 11 because you don't have to cut and kill your babies like you were saying i mean it's a different kind of uh storytelling usually with a 22 you want to have more story obviously mm -hmm. <laughs> more story yeah. beats um you know i don't know that story-wise this episode's so complicated that it deserves 22 minutes but um but like you know you you know usually in an 11 minute cartoon you don't have too much to do with a like a character arc has to be pretty simple you basically have to have a character be presented with a problem they come up with the wrong way to solve that problem <laughs> and, uh, you know, suffer through the wrong solution and then figure it out at the end with, you know, and figure out how to solve their own problem the right way. Um, you know, Jenny has a lot of foibles and a lot of the episodes revolve around her making bad choices. And this is certainly a fine example of that uh, victim of fashion, you know, and it was, we kind of like did something, trying to get a little bit serious in a very offhanded way, which is like, you know, the fact that when she's, when she all of a sudden in the second half of the episode doesn't know how to transform and become skinny she starts yeah. taking she starts purging all of her mm -hmm. weapons and all the things that make her practical until she's basically a stick and obviously that was kind of a metaphor for yes. you know eating eating disorders and all that kind of stuff that you know it was a very serious thing but we did a very had a very light hand light touch touching on that and very very you know symbolically and metaphorically touched on that idea but like you know 
it was kind of the bigger idea in the story that kind of maybe maybe gave it uh, gave it the worth to be that long um you know uh but yeah it's you know once i got onto shows like gravity falls or uh kid cosmic where we were telling half our stories to begin with it's a different you kind of like come at it from a more serious story structure perspective than you have to on an 11 minute cartoon in 11 minute cartoon you can just kind of riff um mm -hmm. you know for a long time and just do gags with the, just a very simple setup and, and conclusion um kind of at the beginning of the end it doesn't take too much to make it um to get to 11 minutes and you know even less with seven minutes seven minutes is real yeah you really don't have much story you can tell in seven minutes i think uh, ice cube said it best he's like yeah this is how you do a movie or tv show or anything he's like you introduce your characters that's act one you get them into shit that act two act three finale get them out of that shit so um <laughs> you did a really Perfect. good job Perfect. Yeah. that's all you need to know yeah the, the 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 moment you talked about it towards the end when she gets skinny i that's the first thing i picked up i don't know if i would have picked up that uh, as a kid if i would have saw it because right. i was a chubby kid i like to eat i puke is disgusting so <laughs> sure you know There's you know i i, I like that absolutely and then you see that as an adult and i'm like oh shit, they did that in such a great way where they weren't heavy-handed like you said they weren't you know out there or rubbing somebody's nose in it but they showed you the pitfalls of trying to you know, not so much blend in, but like be different or be accepted by your peers and the people mm -hmm. you're growing up with, like what we all go through as kids. Yeah. So you see that aspect in the beginning and then you see her, you know, I don't know what it's like to be a fucking teenage girl, but I, I hear stories and I've got a little girl that I'm raising. She'll be a year and a couple months old, you know, yeah. in a couple months, excuse me. Um, so having to have that on the back burner and have to think about that. You know, it, it made it easy to spot some things that uh, possibly could pop up down the road if you don't pay attention, man. So hats off to you guys for, oh, for well, doing that you. episode. <laughs> um, now, as we transition into the last um, the last episode you picked, um, what was your favorite scene? Did you get to do like you did with um, Speaking No Evil? You got uh, a couple scenes in here that you worked on that you liked No, most? actually, and that's one of the reasons this is one of, um, a favorite of mine because um, I have to give kudos to John Fountain, who was the storyboard artist on this. Like, basically, I don't think I touched anything on this. Um, mm -hmm. This is season three. By this time, um, you know, one of the problems you have with a new uh, series when you're trying to communicate it to anybody else is that it exists mostly in your head. And until you start getting episodes that and getting them where you like them to be, it's harder for anybody else to kind of hook into what you're trying to do. Um, so luckily by this time on season three we got a lot of episodes under our hat john's a very good storyboard artist and you know again like brandon comes up with a lot of gags a lot of a lot of uh, story stuff a lot of dialogue that i don't have to touch um and uh you know he we have two seasons worth to look back on so we know the characters a lot better um and we can kind of just play them off of each other and this episode doesn't have a lot huge a huge story to it it's just basically tuck being a little shit in several different ways a little weirdo um and it's funny because this episode does something successfully that a very early episode i think does much less better which is the boy who called robot which is an episode where tuck basically is calling for jenny to come rescue him when he doesn't when he's not really in trouble just so he can impress his friends um so it's basically tuck exploiting jenny's friendship and in this episode he is doing that he's taking advantage of jenny but he's kind of doing it in a less mean way and like just out of his own weird thought processes that because he saw himself in the future as an old man it means he can't be killed now and he can do whatever he likes he's not actually asking jenny to save him she's the one that's like intervening on his behalf because he's acting so stupidly mm -hmm. and saving him from all these dangerous situations he puts himself in because he think he thinks he can't be hurt um so i really like how much better this episode is it's circling kind of around those same character traits and doing a better job of it and you know when some when a board artist comes to you in an episode that would like you don't have to touch or you don't have to change anything and that's a real gift because it means it can go go forward and you don't have to spend the weekend changing things and and getting it to where you're happy with it um you know um and with john a lot of the times that was the case and this kind of episode where he's just kind of characters riffing riffing their personalities kind of riffing off each other was was his bread and butter and he did a great job with this one and i loved everything he did about it so i I don't think I really changed anything at all. It just was like delivered 
and I just sent it through timing and just moved along the, the, the production process. So to me, that's a joy <laughs> as a creator, yeah. getting that kind of stuff. And luckily as the team evolved and, and as we got more episodes under my belt, like the, the more and more of that happened as the season seasons went on, which was kind of a shame because I'd hoped to do another season, season four, and it really felt like in season three, we were a well of machine and like everything was mm -hmm. clicking and I was not having to spend every single weekend working to fix things. And so, you know, it would have been great to have done a fourth season because hopefully everybody would have stuck around and would have had them. The, the dream team that I'd assembled would have had time to do more. Um, but this is just an, for me an episode that like I love because um, none of the gags are mine. I don't have to worry about whether they're funny or not. I find most of them funny. Uh, it feel very much John's personality shining through. And, um, uh, you know, I, I like it because Tuck's one of my favorite characters and I've liked how he, uh, I've liked how he's behaving this episode. <laughs> and, Absolutely. The, and the dumb jokes, I always like a dumb joke. I also like a dumb transformation joke. I love the dumb uh, transformation where in Speak a New Evil where Jenny has a can-can dancer basically come out of her belly just so her mom can guess the word can. Yeah. <laughs> and I love the stupido meter in this one, which allows Jenny to know whenever Tuck is in trouble without him calling for help like he did in The Boy Who Cried Robot. He's just like, he's doing something stupid. I got to go check out what, <laughs> what it is. I didn't know what the can-can dancer was. And I was like, how did she get ant from that? I, I didn't understand it until I had to Google it. I'm like, oh, these guys are really smart. That's what they did. I, <laughs> I see what you guys did. So I, I like can't I said, remember I who came up was. with the can-can dancer. I think it might have been me, but it might have been it might have been Kukulwin. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was, that was uh, as they like to say, oh, chef's kiss, man. Uh, and speaking of John, he was actually one of the guys that wrote in. And uh, I remember his I remember his question because I, I, I I'll tell you what I told him after, but uh, he was like, if uh, my life as teenage robot gets to go again, can he's like, can I work on the show, please? Um, and he said, if, and I told him, I said, you spelt when wrong. Um, so when this show gets picked up again, John well, would like we'll to work about, on it. We'll see about that. I don't know if that'll ever <laughs> happen, but John, of course, would be one of the first people I call. Um, Beautiful. Uh, I mean, I am. I, I think we were talking about this before we started recording, but I, I am making an, a little bit of an effort to continue the show in that I'm telling yes. me a, a new original story. Uh, I started it last year to celebrate 20 years from the show premiere. Um, and uh, on my newsletter, if you sign up at robrenzay.com and you sign up for my newsletter, um, where I've been doing like kind of a serialized chapter by chapter mm -hmm. new story with Jenny. Um, and actually, it's been online hiatus because I've had to. I've been writing the third uh, the third book in the Horrible Bag series, and I had to take a break from the Teenage Robot story. But now I've been writing new chapters, and I'm going to premiere one either next week or the following week. Uh, the chapters will start up again, so the uh, the long hiatus will be over for the Teenage Robot fans who have signed up for my newsletter. So now is a perfect time if you can get in on you can get in and you can review the old chapters and be there when the new chapters come out. So, ladies and gentlemen, all those uh, descript or all those links will be in the description of the show notes below so make sure you click sign up for the newsletter and make sure you click and go buy the third book uh when it drops man um before before we roll off of uh those two things you just said man does it feel like 20 years has passed uh sometimes it does yeah sure yeah. um but yeah no time you know team time gets getting faster when you uh as you get older um i mean i've done a lot since the show ended in the been very happy with all the other stuff I've done. I mean, most people would roll in and try and do another show of their own, but I really wanted a break from that um, and it took a very long break and never really did. I never done another cartoon show of my own, but um, maybe Horrible Bag will exist as some sort of show in the future. I'd love to do that. Um, but uh, it's been a joy to do the books and I've had such a great time after the show with all the other projects I've worked on. So uh, it's, you know, it's kind of weird to think that it's been 20 years since it premiered. Um, and uh, it gives me quite a bit of pleasure that people remember the show, you know, uh, and that uh, there are still fans out there that 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 um, hunger for more. So, um, yeah, I don't know. It's weird. It's weird to think about it. It seems like the blink of an eye uh, and then 20 years have passed. It, it really does, man. And uh, when when you sit back and you think 20 years, you know, you start writing something new in the lore of my life as a teenage mm -hmm. robot was it hard obviously you came up with these characters you breathed life into these characters but was it hard to slip back into those characters from so long ago it, uh it was easier than i thought it would be the, the hardest part was getting started um mm -hmm. <laughs> to commit yeah. to doing it um because of the pressure of the fans and knowing what they might expect but 
ironically doing like a prose story is a lot less pressure than like doing a season four you know of this show because so much time has passed um uh and i've seen so many like revivals not do it right um yes so you know would i want to do a season four probably now that i've done this pro store i feel like more confident in my ability to bring the characters back but it was kind of like i'm doing this is a different format it's not going to be a cartoon you know you're going to have to like do i'm going to give you a few pictures kerwin's going to do a few pictures for you but you're going to have to visualize a lot of stuff for yourself um and once i got rolling on it i didn't knowing once i had alex's uh participation i knew like okay that's taken care of there'll be some fun visuals mm -hmm. that'll really help um but like once i started writing it like i kind of fell back into the characters relatively easily um you know and uh you know i got my own series on disc as well and i watch it and you know watched a few episodes to come back to it but the fact that i was doing something different with the characters i think that helped me get over the kind of um anxiety hurdle <laughs> of yeah. jumping back in after such a long time because i haven't literally really, really have never touched haven't touched them since the show ended i kind of just put them away and thought you know that's it who knows what will happen maybe someday they'll come back but not for now um and i never I've, I've watched i've looked at fan art forever i've never read one piece of fan fiction because of the chance that i one might one day want to do more mm -hmm. with the characters um um, so I've never, I've never really seen what people have done with it. I know, I know kind of, I know where people's heads are at on the show and yeah. know what a lot of fan interest <clears throat> is about it. And like, it's a lot of like, who will she end up with? Will Jenny end up with Brad or Sheldon? And I'm like, I'm not going to tell you that. And I, <laughs> maybe neither one of them. So, you know, like that kind of, that, those kind of uh, fan questions, I know they, that people get obsessed on. Um, mm -hmm. It's not really as much of a concern for me as a creator. Like that's not really, because that's not story. You know what I mean? Like uh, who ends up together is like, well, that's the end of the story, right? That's like the end, like any show that like brings characters that were like kind of star crossed together and then continues after that. It's never quite as satisfying because that's kind of like an emotional end to things for those characters. So um, Jenny and Brad are not getting together in the new story, nor are Jenny and Sheldon. Nor Jenny and Misty. She decided she liked girls better than boys. None of that's happening. <laughs> a lot of that relationship is not stuff is not uh, not happening. But there's some good good fun stuff, including the creation of a new crust cousin, um, who will be revealed uh, fully in this next chapter when when the show comes off hiatus. I teased her um, before I had to take the show uh, take a break. Um, but uh, there's a third crust cousin out there, and she will uh, she will show up in this new chapter. So trying to give the fans some new stuff and as well as a, a peek at their old favorites. Beautiful. And last question before we move off of uh, off of the uh, the newsletter um, and the new My Little My Life as a Teenage Robot. Um, do you have a ending in your head yet, or are you just having fun with it? I mean, I have an ending for this story, and whether I do more stories or not, we'll see. I've got an idea kind of for another story after this one concludes, but I'm definitely going to have to take a break. Yeah. Because <laughs> this one, like this one I imagined originally, I thought like, it'll be maybe four or five, maybe six chapters, maybe seven. I'm like, I've already done six chapters, and I'm about not even, maybe about halfway through the story. So like, it keeps expanding because I start writing the characters. And I don't want each chapter to be so long that somebody opens the like their email and was like, oh my God, how long does this go on for? I'm trying to make them the appropriate size for like an email, you know, like, an, like a long email, like, you know what I mean? Like a, a little story that you get, but a little mini story within the big story. But like the next episode, the episode that I thought would be, the, the, the amount of story that I thought would be like the new chapter seven is actually chapter seven and chapter eight. So like, you know, it's nice because the, the fans will get more chapters, but like I, it keeps going and going and going. So one reason I had to take it on take it on break because I thought originally I will write this while I'm waiting to start on book three. Mm -hmm. And then like I'm book three is now due and I have <laughs> written, I've been writing this teenage robot story that's like going to be twice as long at least as I thought it would be. I got to I got to take a break. So I apologize to the fans who have had to wait in the middle and we've read my first half of the story and they're now waiting for it to come back but uh, i am um, i misjudged the amount of time everything was going to take me very badly <laughs> very badly indeed <laughs> hey man well like i said if uh if we've if we've stayed on the hook for this long it's been 20 years since this one started man what's another what's another couple months what's another year or so man sure that's um, good 
I liked it. Absolutely. Um, what did they say? It's the such and such makes the heart grow fonder. Distance. Is absence. That, what that one is. I think it's absence. absence. There you go. <laughs> well, absence. Yeah, there's been a lot of absence, but. Uh, and it's Jenny, making Jenny our heart grow that much fonder. Um, so TBD, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so we did a little bit of talk, and I'm going to nail this title this time, Indestructible. Um, we yes. did a little bit of talk on that one before. Um, so I figure we can uh, maybe talk about your favorite scenes in this one, and then we can rotate to some fans' questions, and we can get out of here. Yeah, Man, yeah. So yeah a favorite scene question. or two from uh, Indestructible? Um, yeah, I mean, my favorite scene is probably the... Um, well, there's a lot. Of, all the gags are great, but I like the... Yeah. Um, the one, the final, the final big evil Knievel uh, stunt that he's going to do when he's going to jump over the tank of sharks. Um, and uh, I don't know, I, jumping the shark, I feel like it was even a cultural reference. reference back then. Yeah. But like it's, um, it was less so 20 years ago. Now it's like everywhere mm -hmm. people know what that means. But back at the time, yeah. um, you know, that was all John coming up with that idea. Um, so I'm a big fan of the jumping the sharks a bit. I like when he looks in the future scope because uh, the future shock. Is another one of my favorite um, episodes, and I'm glad we mm -hmm. brought the future scope back uh, so he can see himself as a little old man. Um, I like that he didn't, apparently, if he grew tall at some point, he shrunk again and is exactly <laughs> the same size as an old man as he is as a, as a little kid. Um, so the, I enjoy that the, the future scope showed up. Um, and like I mentioned before, the stupidometer, which isn't really a scene, but a concept. I'm a big, I'm a big fan of that. <laughs> that was a very Absolutely. useful invention. <laughs> that it was. And, uh, I, I don't know if you guys invented this or not, but my favorite scene in this whole episode was when he was trying to get all of the, the kids in his class to to pay him to do these mm -hmm. these just crazy, crazy things that would uh, put his life in danger. But uh, he goes and he tries to run headfirst into a brick wall and then Jenny saves him. And yep. then you don't you guys don't come out and say it, but it kind of alludes to it. And uh, she goes, you could have been hurt. He's like, but yeah, but I didn't die type of thing. That's what I took from it. He's like, yeah, we did, but we didn't die. So I don't know if you guys invented that phrase yet, because uh, like I said, it wasn't said. But that was the vibe I got from it. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah, I, yeah, I don't know that we invented that phrase. But yeah, no, that's, <laughs> uh, that's, uh, yeah, I mean, like, you know, basically talk is just a being a real idiot in this episode and getting reaching yeah. the wrong conclusion several times <laughs> the idea of like oh that i'm slated is. to be an old man i guess i can do anything between now and then <laughs> like no you can't of course not and yeah, what youth gives you man um so i figure what we can do is we wrote 10 to some fans questions and we had yeah. quite a few so ladies and gentlemen we're not going to be able to ask uh ask all of them we'll ask as many as we can um arturo jose 518 wanted to know um, could Rob Renzetti uh, ever reveal Jenny's father? I was betting that XJ9's father was the captain of the Skyway Patrol. Have you ever said or alluded to who it might be? I mean, I have mentioned I mentioned something. He may be cheating off me because I've mentioned something like that before. Um, yeah. One concept for Jenny's dad, who, who we probably would have done an episode with in season four, was that he is a military man. He was part of Skyway Patrol. And that that's mm. when him and... Because Nora was part of Skyway Patrol. Nora Wakeman, she, when she was younger. Um, and that's like she's she's his dad in funding name only meaning that like Nora used some some skyway patrol uh materials or money to get the xj project up off the off the ground um but we never really figured any of that stuff out but yeah she he would probably be a military man of some sort in, in some kind of high muckety muck in in skyway patrol that was that was the basic idea but we never got to do anything um, that was an idea we were thinking about for season four was to bring jenny's father quote unquote into things well, ladies and gentlemen if you want to see who the father is start writing nickelodeon um <laughs> xj <laughs> xj zero one to know uh could there be more art books made i love the my life as a teenage robot sketchbook but i know not all the production art was included it would be great to have a second volume any chance you got a second volume that you want to do for i mean uh... there was some talk of that i think it never got off the ground fred fred cybert again was again the, who mm -hmm. spearheaded that thing certainly something that could be done um but i don't have any time to do it myself right now there was a there is a giant um the only other book that has any xj xj9 teenage robot artwork in it yeah uh is there's this nickelodeon book that's all about like nicktoons the first mm -hmm. years or something and every show got a chapter and teenage robot is in there and there's a lot of beautiful um artwork from the show a lot of color artwork in that um book um but it's it's out of print now and, and it's hard to find um yeah i mean there's a ton i've you know all the all there's a lot of stuff that's been scanned and digitally i have a lot of the physical backgrounds and i've scanned a bunch 
Um, you can see some of the Teenage Robot backgrounds on, on, on my website, robinsaid.com. There's a Teenage Robot page and there's a gallery of um, like a dozen um, backgrounds from the show. Some of them from Victim of Fashion, which we're talking about in other various episodes. Um, and I'm going to start scanning and put more of those up there. But yeah, I would love to do a full on art book. I'm just not, you know, uh, something to pursue for sure. Nothing that, um, but nothing that's immediately going to happen right now. Um, I don't know if a publisher would find it to be, you know, useful or, or if it would be more of a self-publishing thing like the sketchbook was done. Um, but uh, something certainly to look into and uh, maybe think about for the future. TBD, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Sonic Master 79 wanted to know, and this is one of my favorite questions that somebody's asked so far. Um, did you ever want to do an episode using stop motion or clay? Or clay, so, excuse me, stop motion and clay. Uh, no, I mean, conceptually, sure. I never, I don't think we ever really pursued anything like that. Um, the place, the, the part to do would have been probably in the dream episode where like, um, Jenny's dreaming and she has these different dreams and different art styles. That would have been maybe the place to do it. But, um, we were so under the gun. That was like a, I forget. That must be, is that second season or first season? I think it's first season. This is always, the show is always just so far from, oh, <laughs> all right. Oh, uh, yeah. behind production schedules and stuff like that. And we were already doing like so much extra, like, uh, you know, called our color scripts and the color design of the episodes are really complicated with all these different color, uh, color palettes changing throughout and stuff like adding something extra in like that. It was, a, it would have been impossible to do, but I, I would love to see a stop motion version of the show it would be fantastic. And, um, so some, you know, it could come back as a stop motion special or something that would be. Oh, wonderful i'd love to do it but in a, at the time i was never i never grasped for that i've been part of a couple of productions we did it on gravity falls you know like we did a, we did that um with just stop motion it's just it's really complicated to get something like that off the ground and yeah. you really have to, it takes a lot of extra time a lot of extra effort so we just didn't have the extra time or the extra effort unfortunately that's a seven minute episode for sure if if i've ever heard of one <laughs> <laughs> so um uh, riley wanted to know what inspired you to name her Jenny XJ9? And what name came to you first, her serial number or her human name? I've always been curious. Well, uh, Jenny came first, and the reason for that is kind of, um, there's a couple of reasons. One is uh, Jenny is a name, it's, it's, it's used a little bit, I think it's more of an East Coast thing than actually a Midwest thing, but Jenny is a, a name for a generator, like for a machine, so. yeah. Jenny is trying to not be a machine anymore. She wants to be a real life person, but she chooses a name for herself that is actually a nickname used for a generator, which is another machine. And that was just kind of like a very deep sly reference to the idea that like she needs to accept who she is and not try to be something she isn't, um, that she should be proud of who she is because she's unique and powerful and, and a true hero. Um, and uh, so knowing that that Jenny, that that works uh, as like, had that double kind of meaning to it. From Jenny, I decided, well, what's her model number gonna be? And that's where the J9 came on, came in. You know, if I'd gone the other way, if I was like J9 that came first, thinking of J and nine, it's more like Jane would be the name that would kind of, yeah. you would get the human name of Jane out of J9 maybe. But the idea was that I wanted her to be named Jenny because of the idea that like, she's trying to get away from her machine nature and yet she's naming herself after a machine. Beautiful. Um, Sabbath B. Driver wanted to know, what was the decision to go with a Max Fleischer art style? Because it looks unique and outstanding. Well, thank you. I mean, I was a huge fan of Fleischer cartoons. And um, so the 1930s uh, kind of uh, style of, uh, you know, Fleischer and all the other 1930s cartoons were, were a huge influence. But we kind of tried to mix that in with a more stylized kind of 1950s UPA feeling as mm -hmm. well. Um, but we... I'm, Alex and I were both huge fans of 1930s cartoons. Um, I like the rubber hose style, but we wanted to do something that was a little different from that. So we kind of took that as our basis and then kind of Alex mostly tweaked it and brought other influences into into the look of the show. Um, but it was mostly just because we were we were we were both fans of uh, 1930s cartoons and particularly the Flesher the Flesher Studio stuff, which was my favorite card. Popeye was my favorite. Uh, cartoon character growing up and uh you know the black and white popeyes that the fleshers mm -hmm. did were like they're the gold standard for me of anything the of the you know the expression of that character um was was you know that was top tier uh, popeye for me were the cartoons that they did with him 
Um, so uh, it was just kind of a, a you know, no brainer that that would be an influence on the show style of the show. How long did it take for you and Gendy to get onto Popeye when you guys first started talking and hanging out? I got to imagine it was pretty, uh, pretty evident. Oh yeah, I mean, when often. Gendy and I met, I mean, we we instantly, <laughs> we instantly had we had all the same tastes and we liked all the same cartoons mostly. Um, uh, though we, when we were when we were in Chicago, when we first met in Chicago, we were mostly studying the Warner Brothers Looney Tunes stuff mm -hmm. because we had a teacher. Uh, Stan Hughes at the school we were going to at the time, Columbia College in in, in Chicago. We were both and we were in the film department in the animation um, uh, department within the film department. And our teacher Stan Stan had a bunch of old Looney Tune cartoons on sixteen millimeter. Um, so we actually had the physical. We could look at physical frames. We could put the actual sixteen millimeter cartoon on a moviola and like study the how they did so things frame by frame. Um, so we really were digging into Warner Brothers at that time, um, but we both loved the, we both loved the Fleischer stuff, especially the Popeye stuff. We were both big yeah. fans. I mean, we both you know before Gendy got his chance to do uh, Popeye at Sony, Craig and I were actually uh, Craig mostly, and then he brought me and we're, we we had a go at Popeye too, and didn't it didn't get off anywhere off the ground. It didn't get as far as Gendy got. We just got a we got a story up on up on its legs and then it was like nope we don't want that story and then you know gendy took gendy came in sometime after that and took his his whack at it but we're all huge fans of popeye he's a great he's a great character he's just one of the best cartoon characters ever created and especially the fleischer cartoon version of him is just fantastic absolutely i can't agree more um and last question about that uh any chance that that script that you got you and craig worked on ever saw the light of day anybody got a copy no of i mean i mean gendy came after us and that would have been new work and he got further with it so i'm assuming they liked what he did more than what craig and i did uh yeah uh but yeah no i think i don't know if pop a new popeye feature will ever see the light of day it's there's various reasons for it the the, the rights are tied up with various people who mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know that they, I don't know that anybody can agree on what a Popeye feature should be. Um, yeah. Enough so that it'll ever be made. Um, at least, you know, I mean, Gendy had enough, Gendy, should, if anybody would have enough clout to push it forward. And, you know, his, since the Hotel Transylvania movies have been such a hit, it's possible he might be able to revive, but I know he's working on an original idea of his now for them. So I don't know that he wants to go back and visit it. He took his whack at it. And uh, if anybody comes up with it, we'll see <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. uh it's strange that it hasn't been done because he's such a great character but like it's hard for it's hard for modern execs to see what's great about him or to think that kids will enjoy watching a very old man with a very strange body who mumbles a lot <laughs> you know like on paper it doesn't look like it's going to be very appealing in the, unless you're a fan of the character and know it and watch it you know be expressed in the way it was in those Fleischer cartoons, it's 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 uh, maybe a tough sell. Well, maybe one day when those uh, those those execs that don't know the uh, the genuine curiosity and, and and love that that people have for those characters, um, when they tar start to phase out and people like you, Craig and Gendy, start to fill those roles once you guys are done doing what you're doing, maybe we'll get to see that Popeye cartoon. I man. don't think that I'll ever fill that role, but I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll uh, I, th I thank you for the good wishes for my future. We'll see. We'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. Nicholas wanted to know whose idea was it to name one of the incidental characters after Felix the Cat's creator, Otto Mesmer. I love that no. little tribute. Otto is one of my personal heroes. Uh, that would be me, um, because we were fans of Felix the Cat as well, and we wanted to have the diner kind of be a theme restaurant. So mm -hmm. you know, the the front is basically Felix, and so we decided it should be named after Felix's creator. Uh, so that's what that's what we did. Of course, we made. That Mesmer, when he shows up, is actually a villain, <laughs> unfortunately, because yeah. I didn't want, you know, Otto Mesmer is, is, again, one of my heroes is too, one of my animation heroes. So, but uh, the Mesmer that we meet in Teenage Robot is not, uh, not related to that Mesmer at all. <laughs> they share a name, but that's all they share. There you go, man. Uh, Takamura Rules wanted to know, uh, was games like Mega Man and Mega Man X an influence on the creation of the show? No, I didn't know what Mega Man was until like until after Teenage Robot was up the up, up the ground, and then people showed it to me and and and, and told me about it. But no, it was, that one particularly wasn't an influence. Beautiful. Um, would you 
obviously Fred had went to Nickelodeon after Cartoon Network and Hanna Barbera. Mm -hmm. um, uh, bedroom, <laughs> bedroom dweller wants to know: Would you have would you have ever pitched the show to Cartoon Network? Looking back, if Nickelodeon didn't pick it up, um, sure. I mean, it was you know Cartoon Network was kind of in the DNA of. Um, I mean, let Craig and Gendy and I all started at, at Hanna Barbera, which became Cartoon Network. Dexter and Powerpuff were both on Cartoon Network. Those are our sensibilities. Those shows are our sensibilities. If you think of those shows as being Cartoon Network sensibilities, then it makes sense that my life as a teenage robot would have been a fine Cartoon Network show. I brought the sensibilities that uh, that all of us had, had developed together and brought that to the show. So, um, you know, some people think it's would be more at home on Cartoon Network than Nickelodeon, but Nickelodeon made the show. So I'm forever grateful for them that they did make the show. Um, but I think it certainly could have felt, it would have felt at home at, uh, on Cartoon Network as well. I don't think it would have felt at Absolutely. home necessarily on Disney, um, no. but I think it felt at home on Nickelodeon, probably would have felt at home on, and certainly on, felt at home on Cartoon Network among those other shows. Absolutely, man. We got a couple more here. Um, SAS Productions 35 wants to know, um, what are your thoughts on the show gaining such a cult following in the recent years? Also say hi to Rob for me, huge fan. <laughs> well, hello uh, to yourself. Um, I mean, I'm very pleased that the show, I don't know how large the cult following is. It's hard to judge. I mean, I have my followers on Twitter and that's really the most, the way I interact with it Then, besides the people mm -hmm. that subscribe to the newsletter. Um, but of course, I'm pleased that uh, people still uh, enjoy the show and are interested in it. And, and, and uh, uh, you know, it's easy enough to do these things and when they're not a hit when they come out and Teenage Robot was not a hit, otherwise it would have continued. Um, you know, you imagine it will um, kind of fade into obscurity, but, you know, because there is this internet culture, which was just being kind of formed at the time the show was being created, you know, I think that's how that's helped people that have this interest in the show to connect in a way that they wouldn't have, um, in a way that I couldn't conceive of at the time we were doing the show because the car, because the, you know, internet was kind of in its nascent days um, and we didn't, we had no idea what it would become or the fact that it would kind of bring disparate groups with similar interests together in this unique way that we've all lived through. Beautiful. We got two more here. Um, uh, Space Girl Station 29811 to know. Uh, in the series finale, Escape from Cluster Prime, there are some scenes that utilize, utilize CGI backgrounds, um, the old Fleischer cartoons that mm -hmm. use the um, shit, stereotypical process. I, I don't know if that was um i think it's stereoscopic but um but yes um, that's probably yeah, what it is sorry what's the what is our question at the end of this i'm sorry um I, that was pretty much it I, I guess she just wanted to know more about the cgi backgrounds that they were inspired by the old fleischer cartoons they were definitely for sure yeah. in fact they were actually set up like that old those old fleischer um 3d backgrounds so like we talked about we we're huge fans of the fleischer show they fleischer cartoons and stuff um, they were amazing artists and they did a lot of tech, had a lot of technical innovations. And one of them was this, these 3D backgrounds, which are, it's, there's an illustration, there's an Art of the Fleischer book and they have an illustration in it. And if you are interested, you could probably, you could probably track it down online. Um, but basically it was a turntable. The, the guys, um, the guys built a, they built a turn, they put like, they built sculptural elements of the background on a turntable. And so you would have the flat screen and then they, instead of, um, instead of like filming the animation down like this on a flatbed, which mm -hmm. is what you normally do with a camera up here, they had a setup like this so that the, there was a, there was like a sheet of glass and they'd slide the cells down in between that sheet of glass. And behind that sheet of glass was this 3D model of like, it's the town that Popeye's walking through, right? So as Popeye walked through, they'd, they'd change the frames of his walk cycle or whatever. And they'd advance the, they'd advance the sculptural element a little bit each time. But the way they got away with that was because it was 3D. It wasn't just like they were pulling a, another flat thing through. It rotated a little bit. So the so there was this crazy, beautiful 3D effect where like a like a, a house would be like a little bit further away from camera. And as it came through screen, it would get closer and then go further away like that. So you get this slightly rounded 3D effect mm -hmm. on the Bee Gees. And it's subtle, but you, you watch a cartoon with them in there, you'll see it as a character was walking by. So 
when we did they were when we did the escape from cluster pine they were very anxious for us to use cg in some way because they had this cg department and they were trying to justify the use of it like an in-house cg department and i didn't really want the characters to be i didn't want some characters to be cg and other characters not because i always felt like that always stood out the only people that ever did that i think to a good effect was like on the futurama like when they would do the they did like the rocket as cg and whatever yes. they were able to like really blend it into the style of the show but i thought like we could recreate this fleischer technique where we could basically build in a cg space build a turntable of cluster prime like the cluster prime city so there is a there's a I think it's just one scene and maybe a couple scenes where we use that that three that three D background. There's a one main one though that's like this is like here's our Fleischer moment where Jenny's kind of being shown Cluster Prime by the other uh, robots that she's met there, and behind her is a slowly rotating three D. Uh, not that's not it's a three D model. It's nothing's physically built, but it's built in CG that does the same thing. It rotates and kind of in a round way behind her. And um, like we spent a lot of time with the CG people, like showing them that because I had that yeah. book, like showing them the photo in the book, saying this is the effect we're kind of after, um, and they matched it pretty good. I don't have a, I don't, I, I, I don't have a clip. I always thought there would be a clip of it online, but um, um, you know, I have the full Escape from Cluster Prime, but like I don't have like a clip of that one scene. But I would really, I guess I should figure out how to make a clip. I know the technology's <laughs> out there. I'm just so old fashioned, like to take us put my you know to put a full movie in and then like make a clip of one scene i don't it take me too long um to bother with it but that or yeah that's that's in there and it was a direct reference to that technology that the fleshers came up with beautiful and then uh last question if you could sum up my life as a teenage robot and your entire experience one word one phrase one sentence one paragraph <laughs> what would it be I'm, I work in the food our... industry, so we do that all the time right there. We wait right. till you're eating, we wait till you're drinking, and sure. then we ask you the questions. You know what I mean? Uh, I would. The phrase would be heartbreaking and heartwarming, which is, it was heartbreaking in that the show was not the success I hoped it to be. It was also heartbreaking that it was like, it broke my, it, it broke me as a person to work on the show. It was very difficult to create the show. I worked very, mm -hmm. very long hours for a very long time. The heartwarming part was the people that I worked with and, and, and the end result. Um, I had a great crew. We all became very good friends. I'm friends with most of them to this day, though I don't see some of them very often because they've moved away, like John Fountain and Brandon Cruz are both on the East Coast now. Um, but I still consider them my family. Um, we we really bonded as a crew. I was so lucky to have the great people that I worked with. And, um, you know, I'm so lucky to have the fans out there still remembering the show. Um, and, you know, getting away from it, getting a little bit of distance from it, and then looking at it again, um, it's easier for me to enjoy it as a piece of entertainment rather than like a, an assignment I gave mm -hmm. myself uh, that I was con always felt like I was constantly behind and in, in danger of failing. Um, so, you know, yeah, it was uh, it was the toughest thing I've ever done in career wise. And I'm so proud and so happy that I ended up doing it because um, because of people uh, like you and the people that have written in and are watching us right now or the people that are still fans of the show. Um, it, you know, that's very, that's the heartwarming part for me, the fact that the, it's still remembered and, and celebrated by so many people. Well, you gave us something to remember and you guys gave us something to celebrate and we always appreciate that, man. Uh, Rob, for the folks that might not know, where can they come and find out what Rob's working on? Where can they go for the newsletter? Where can they go on social media to say, hey, Rob, I love what you do? Yeah, I mean, uh, I have my website, Um, you, There's uh, stuff about the new books I'm creating. The Horrible Bag of Terrible Things is the first one in a series of three books. The second book, which is called The Terrible Tower, no, I'm sorry, The Twisted Tower of Endless Torment. That'll be out this summer. And the third book, which I don't have a title for, and I've just written and sent it to my publisher, will be out the following summer. So you've got a summertime read, if you'd like, uh, for the next few years. Um, and I've, like I said, I've got a teenage robot page there. I've got a mean and account page there. All my, I talk about all the cartoon stuff I've created, even the one shot pilots, all that's there to enjoy. You can sign up for the newsletter if you want to read a new, uh, teenage robot story. So that's robbernsday.com and social media. I'm mostly on, uh, Twitter as I will continue to call it. Um, I'm <laughs> it's simply at Rob Renzetti there. So you can find me pretty easily on Twitter. And um, I post real, I post there about Teenage Robot as well and about my pet rabbit, Digby Flopwell, and about other <laughs> various things that I like. Um, so that's where you'd find me. I'm also on Instagram, but I'm barely there. Um, it's not worth your time to track me down. I wish I could say become my follower on Instagram as well. You can if you want. There's some special Instagram stuff there, but I don't 
I haven't gone there. Doing one social media thing is about all I'm capable of, it, 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 yeah. it turns out. Um, so yeah, robrenzetti.com and at robrenzetti on Twitter are the two best places to find me. Um, and uh, yeah, if you want to find out what I'm doing, what I'm working on, uh, and read some teenage robot stuff, you can you can do it all at those two locations. Beautiful. Well, he's been Rob. I've been Julian. It's been a What's in My Head podcast, and it's been another piece of your childhood. Good night. <laughs>